Dream in Quantum. Written by J.B. Stephen. Introductory and ending music by Luis Ramirez. Cyrus Parson had always wanted to make a difference. He and his wife Emily had been dedicated activists for most of their adult lives. And when they first started dating during college, he told her outright that he wanted to save the world from itself. Of course, when he had said from itself, he actually meant from people. Computer engineering would be his way of contributing to the cause. After dating for just over a year, he and Emily had married. Two beautiful sons following not long after that. It was difficult for them to raise two young children while they were still in the middle of their education with nothing but crappy part-time jobs and Cyrus's scholarships to fund their young lives. But they had made it work and created a modest, loving home for their kids to spend their early years growing up in. Those indeed were the happiest of days. Their hard work had finally paid off when Cyrus had graduated from MIT with top honors in computer engineering. His inbox was quickly flooded with job interviews from most of the major R&D companies throughout the United States. And after reviewing his prospects, he accepted an incredibly generous offer from the tech conglomerate Firmament. Within a month, He and his young family had moved out to Silicon Valley to start their new lives. American dreams fresh in their young minds and money in their pockets. Cyrus had quickly ascended to the top of his field through major breakthroughs in quantum computing developments. Firmament had a very diverse set of software and hardware departments all over the world. But the one Cyrus worked for in California was highly classified, forcing him to be very secretive about his work, even with his family. Every new employee in his department was forced to sign an NDA, which Cyrus gathered to be about the size of an epic novel. He distinctly remembered the sound the hefty binder made when the CFO dropped it from a foot high onto the table in front of him. It was a document that carried real weight, both figuratively and literally. Cyrus often wished he could talk with his family about the exciting and innovative work he was doing at Firmament, but for all they knew, he was just a high-level tech employee receiving a very generous salary. They could never really know what it was he was working on. Every weekday morning, and to be honest, most weekends, Cyrus would eat a light breakfast, fill up his mug with fresh coffee, and kiss his wife and two sons goodbye. There was something about the routine that he enjoyed starting off his day right with his family there to see him off. The company had offered to give him a driver, but he actually preferred driving himself to the office. It gave him time alone to reflect, and also some time to listen to his favorite podcasts on the way to work. The 25-minute drive to and from the office each day proved to be much of the only solace between his job and his family that he would ever get. The older he became, and the more he watched his kids grow in front of his eyes, the more he came to realize that he should have spent more time with them much sooner, something he often admitted to Emily, yet could never really figure out how to achieve. She was always very understanding, though Cyrus could often tell that she felt the same, and that it made her sad sometimes. He didn't take many, or any vacations at all really, something which in truth he felt very guilty about. 
His work was indeed important, but he could never have done anything without the support of his family, and he provided very well for them in return. They were everything, and he had made a promise to himself that once his project was at a stable point, he would begin to distance himself from his work for a while, spend more time with his two sons before he and his wife suddenly found themselves heartbroken, looking into empty bedrooms after they went off to university. Normally when he left for work every morning, he felt that he was leaving to do something special, something important. Recently things began to feel very different at Firmament, though he couldn't quite put his finger on what exactly had changed. <sighs> Sorry, Ed. Cyrus sighed as he placed his mug of coffee on the front desk of Firmament's lobby, all the while fumbling inside his briefcase for his employee ID card. Ed Matsuda, the front of house at Firmament, had of course seen Cyrus come into work almost every day for over ten years, but the protocols were very strict about entering and leaving the building. Firmament kept a tight leash on all of its employees, especially ones with high levels of security clearance. Cyrus looked up from his disorganized briefcase, spying Ed watching him from the corner of his eye, a look of mild amusement plastered all over his friendly and inquisitive face. Cyrus chuckled, hanging his head in shame. <sighs> Sorry, it's been a rough week, but I know it's in here somewhere. Cyrus silently thanked some invisible force for it being Friday. Ed smiled, waving him off. Were it up to me, I would just let you in, but then I might get fired. Ed was a really great guy, and had always been friendly with Cyrus from the beginning. In a way, Cyrus felt like Ed was his work mentor. Despite them being similar ages and Ed knowing little about computer engineering, or what it was Cyrus actually did there. Cyrus was not just another pasty, loner computer nerd shuffling into work every morning with barely a thought for his hygiene, appearance, or manners. And Ed had liked that about him. Along with the fact that Cyrus never touted himself as being above anyone else at his workplace, despite his prestige as a scientist. Ed had taken it upon himself to inform Cyrus about the workplace dynamic when he first got his job there. What to watch out for. Who to schmooze. People who were or were not total douchebags. Those sorts of tiny and annoying details of office politics that intelligent and logical people absolutely despised. When Cyrus had ascended the ranks at Firmament, he was very glad to not have to deal with those primitive and animalistic social constructs that lesser beings couldn't help but be ardent slaves to. Ed would often come to the Parson household for dinner during weekdays. And when Cyrus wasn't swamped in work, sometimes at the rate of once a week. He was great with Cyrus's kids. The nickname Uncle Ed was quickly bestowed upon him by Cyrus's two rambunctious sons, and they always loved having Uncle Ed over. Cyrus felt like he could forget about his work for a bit when he hung out with Ed, something he gathered they both enjoyed despite the differences in their career paths. They both loved movies, books, scotch, and dreaming of the future sometimes staying up all too late in their discussions. Cyrus had always felt there was more to Ed than what met the eye. But he never pressed him on his life story. Someday, he would find a way to get Ed to spill the beans on why someone like him was working a job so far below his capabilities. But for the meantime, Cyrus enjoyed his company and his brief daily chats with him every morning before going to his lab. Aha! Annoyingly well hidden beneath some papers at the bottom of his bag lay Cyrus's employee ID card. Got it! he exclaimed, displaying his card triumphantly in front of Ed. Ed examined the photo through dramatically squinted eyes. Well, looks like you all right, though with much less gray hair, he said, jokingly, waving Cyrus through. Cyrus scoffed, shaking his head. He was about to head off when he turned back to Ed suddenly remembering he had meant to ask him something. Uh, listen, Cyrus said as he leaned on Ed's desk. Ed slowly swiveled around in his chair to meet Cyrus's gaze. Yes, he said, in some sort of weird accent he only used with Cyrus. Cyrus looked down his glasses at Ed, a subtle cue between friends that he was trying to be serious with him. 
Emily wants to make uh, pasta tonight, and I have a great bottle of scotch just begging to be opened. You in? Ed looked away, tapping his index finger on his chin, as if he really had to think about the proposition. He then looked back at Cyrus with utter seriousness. Does Dolly Parton sleep on her back? Huh? Cyrus recoiled, genuinely confused. You know, because of her, uh... Ed gestured with both of his open palms in front of his chest. It means yes, Cy. Cyrus looked away, then back to Ed, trying to make sense of his metaphor when it suddenly dawned on him. Oh, was all he could muster in response. Wait, you mean to say you're actually going home for dinner tonight? It almost sounded like a question, save for the rhetorical sarcasm that was dripping from Ed's voice. There was no doubt that Cyrus had been working a lot as of late. Well, I've decided to start spending some more time at home. Things are going well here, and if my estimates are what I think they are, I can maybe start backing away from things a little bit. Cyrus looked down at his arm that was propping him up on Ed's desk. I think it would be good for Emily and the kids, you know? Ed nodded, a genuine smile spreading across his face. Well, (laughs) of course I'm in. I mean, honestly, do you even have to ask at this point? No, Cyrus shrugged. But I always like to warn people of what they're getting into so that they can make a better informed decision. He winked, swiping his ID card at the front barrier. Cyrus could almost see Ed licking his lips in anticipation. Six o'clock, Cyrus yelled from afar. Ed waved in response as he swiveled back to his desk. Emily was an amazing cook, and he did have a killer bottle of scotch he was dying to open with a good friend. The work day would fly by quickly as he thought about that first sip of a great, well-aged bottle of single malt. The older Cyrus got, the more he realized it was all about the simple things. He was about to swipe his card into the console to call his unique elevator to the lobby, when suddenly he eyed someone approaching him. A very slender and fit man, ridiculously kempt and immaculately dressed. Anyone with half a brain could tell by the way the man walked, with his hands firmly clasped behind his perfectly postured back, that he was either head of security or, as Cyrus liked to refer to him, the head butler. Barson, I was just noticing you holding up the line looking for your ID card. Boyd Gonzalez was the quintessential reference of what Ed lovingly referred to as a, quote, total douchebag. Cyrus slowly turned around, meeting Boyd face to face. Yes, thank you for being so impressively observant. Firmament thanks you for your service. Cyrus quickly turned back to the elevator. After an awkward silence, he again looked back at Boyd, noticing that he was still staring at him, though perhaps glaring was the more accurate description. Boyd raised an eyebrow, pursing his lips as he looked Cyrus up and down almost as if he had an imaginary measuring tape and was trying to determine once and for all which one of them was the taller of the two. A question that had been in existence since they first met, yet had never been accurately settled. Anything else I can help you with? Cyrus finally said, breaking the silent battle. He had no idea if Boyd used to be in the military, but he wouldn't have doubted it for a second if it happened to be accurate. Boyd scoffed through his nose, finally relenting. Just try and keep your card somewhere close next time so we can all keep things running smoothly around here. Capiche? Boyd quickly slithered away, hands still clasped behind his back, his fingernails unusually whiter than normal due to the increased pressure in which he grasped his own wrist. Boyd was normally a stiff fellow, but Cyrus usually managed to push him beyond his normal militaristic poker face of absolute discipline. Cyrus shook his head, turning back to the elevator, whispering to himself, Yes, sir, Commander, sir. Mock saluting Boyd as he walked away. Did he seriously just say capiche? Cyrus had even been half tempted to just leave his ID card lying on the floor somewhere, just to really pinch Boyd's nerves, but he knew that would be a bad idea for a plethora of other reasons. Besides, there were plenty of other deliciously passive-aggressive methods of playing the game of office warfare. Cyrus once removed all of the toilet paper and hand towels from the men's washroom that lay closest to Boyd's office, just to see how he would react. Later that day, as predicted, every employee received a condescending email demanding that they be more proactive in informing the custodial staff about replacement personal hygiene products. Cyrus clearly remembered the end tagline of the email being, Be proactive, not inactive. What a toad. Cyrus finally swiped his card into the elevator's console, the console responding with a cheerful, punctuated tune that he had likely heard a thousand times by now. 
This elevator was special, and it only went down. He stepped inside its confined quarters, punching in his floor number, which was located below even the lowest basement level. His floor was very segregated from the rest of the building, requiring a special ID card to even get the elevator to move, and for good reason, of course. The company had built a special lab for them, located far beneath the building, almost a whole new building underground. Cyrus couldn't exactly remember how it came up, but it had been about a year since they moved into the lab, and it had been in production for around a year and a half. While it was true that their equipment was highly sensitive to electromagnetic radiation, he didn't see the exact logic behind spending so much money to move their lab to such a secure location when it was perfectly secure above ground. He didn't worry too much about it, as it didn't affect his team's payroll. Whatever made Firmament more comfortable was fine by him. The level itself was highly secure. In the event someone without clearance took the elevator with him to his designated floor, there were still more security measures to pass through on the floor itself. In front of him was a metallic gate with panes of clear plexiglass that required vocal identification and a facial scan to open. Cyrus Parson, code 04031965, he said clearly and purposefully. In the case that someone unauthorized had recorded his voice, they would also have to provide the unique number that changed at random intervals to open the door, not to mention the facial scan. Cyrus sometimes imagined how it might be possible for someone to break into his lab, and by the time his mind wandered towards decapitated heads, he quickly quashed that train of thought. The security door opened with a hiss, and Cyrus stepped through into the laboratory that housed about three dozen high-level employees. The lab itself was a large, multi-story research space that branched into smaller, unique laboratories for specific projects or tasks. The central area was large and ovular, several stories deep and circled by several balconies. Cyrus, being the head of the lab, had a special office on the upper floor that overlooked the entire lab. He took a quick glance downward at his underlings working at their desks in the common area. A couple of them waved as he entered his closer friends on the senior team, whom he had taken along with him as he climbed the company ladder. Though climbed was now more figurative, as they were now further down than they had ever been. So much for a nice corner office on the 30th floor. Cyrus's friends were all unique and killer scientists in their own right, but together they made a great senior team. The rest of the employees eyed Cyrus with little regard, all with their headphones on. He had nothing against them listening to things during work, but there was something about the way they looked at him when he entered that made him uneasy. Whatever helped them focus on their jobs was fine by him, so long as they delivered on their tasks. He made his way to the office, savoring a few sips of coffee as he walked. Things had slowly been changing at Firmament during the past couple years, almost as if reality had somehow shifted or morphed into a new one, and the people he once knew had become slightly different than they used to be. He really only noticed it maybe two and a half years ago, but he felt as if certain people had been replaced by imposters. Cyrus was certainly not the paranoid type, and he was also pretty certain he didn't suffer from cap syndrome. They all looked the same on the outside, of course, but certain longer-term employees that he dealt with regularly and on friendly terms with had now hardly spoken to him, or at least any more than was absolutely necessary. It was almost as if he did something horrible, and he was the only one not aware of it. He had been so focused on his work, but now that he was thinking about it, there always seemed to be new faces around. New security guards, new custodial staff, new junior employees. The rate of acquisition and change-up of staff was a little unnerving, and much faster than was usual. But it wasn't his prerogative to deal with, so he mostly ignored it. If he remembered to, he might bring it up at the next board meeting. The whole reason he had taken his job with Firmament in the first place was to make a real difference in the world. And with every day that passed, especially recently, he felt as if he was getting just a little bit closer to that goal. Cyrus placed his bag on his desk, flopping down into his chair and savoring another long swig of lukewarm coffee. His first task was to finish his coffee, and then he would make his way downstairs to deal with the problems of the day. He tapped on his keyboard his dormant computer blinking to life on the monitor. His routine usually involved checking emails on the company server, and that was when he eyed the standardized email from the head of security, the title reading, Employee ID Card Accessibility. As usual, it took Boyd no time at all. 
Cyrus figured he must have really gotten on his nerves today. He briefly scanned through the stiff and unpleasant diatribe that normally characterized Boyd's emails. It was almost as if employees didn't enjoy being talked down to or something. No wonder people disliked Boyd. Cyrus deleted the email, taking another final swig of coffee in great satisfaction. Mission complete. Tomorrow, he might just decide to forget his employee ID card altogether. He was genuinely curious to find out how far Boyd might go to deny him entry to the building. Boyd, of course, had access to the lab down below. The real question was, would he let Cyrus in or force him to go back home and get his ID card? It sounded like a fun game for Cyrus when Monday rolled around. Suddenly, Cyrus looked up from his computer, a knock on his office door drawing his attention. One of his colleagues was waiting enthusiastically at the open door. Hey, Andy, come on in. Andy Douglas, one of Cyrus's original team members who had been with him from the beginning, stepped into his office with a cheerful spring in his step. That was typical Andy, always smiling and optimistic. He had the rare ability to pull the group out of the darkest ruts. Andy was carrying a small folder that he promptly placed on Cyrus's desk. Cyrus normally took care of compiling the folder that contained recent analyses and test results for each day of the week, but he was honest when he had said he was going to start stepping back and delegating a bit more. Cyrus willfully admitted that he himself could sometimes be a bit of a control freak, so it was not easy trusting others with his own work. But it was good for him to start letting go a little bit at a time. Cyrus also realized that paper materials were very old-fashioned, and also wasteful, but Cyrus liked to hold paper in his hands. Their data was so sensitive that he preferred they keep physical backups along with digital. But he didn't tell his superiors about that. Firmament preferred to keep their data in-house on their own secure servers, which were spread out across the world in case of failure. But Cyrus wanted a record of what he did there. He would often smuggle out data files on his own drive to print out and store in his own safe. There was something about staring at screens all day he despised, so his small act of retaliation was in keeping paper records. But if anyone were to find out, he would certainly be in deep trouble, maybe even get thrown off his project, perhaps even fired. So, what have we got? Cyrus asked, placing his coffee mug on his desk. Andy promptly sat himself down in front of him. To say it's exceeding our expectations is a massive understatement, Andy said excitedly. He was resting his arms on the chair, slowly rotating side to side, tapping his fingertips together. He was trying to contain his excitement, but Cyrus could see that he wanted to get up and dance around the room like an overenthusiastic teenager. Great to hear. Cyrus purposefully spoke with skepticism, leaning back in his chair in thought. The implications ran through his mind in several streams, as he imagined the day when the Impossible Construct initiative could be fully realized. So the latest iteration of the algorithm took, Cyrus finally said after taking nearly a minute to run a few scenarios through his mind. I think you should see for yourself, Andy smiled. I've prepared a little test uh, so you can see what I mean, but I think we're close to a final version. The smile on Andy's face was satisfying to see. Cyrus enjoyed when his team was buzzing with excitement. They believed in the project, and that made Cyrus feel as if he had a strong foundation on which to stand should something go wrong. He used to hate the days when he was by his lonesome, feeling the pressure when things crumbled into dust instead of working smoothly, as was normal in his profession. The team dynamic they all shared had kept him excited and enthused during the most difficult of days. Okay, let's get them up here. Team meeting. Cyrus reached out to Andy with his open palm, prompting Andy to return the gesture. This had been a long time coming for all of them, and he was looking forward to preparing the next presentation for Firmament's funders. That scotch tonight would be a great way to cap off the week, and a great beginning to a nice weekend getaway with his family. He stood from his chair, flipping through the folder Andy had left on his desk, when he heard something through his open office door. What the hell did you just say to me? Cyrus quickly ran to the door of his office. His senior team was gathered close by, in what looked to be the beginnings of a fistfight. One of Cyrus's team, Byron Jones, looked like he was ready to punch a young programmer right in the face. Byron stood nearly face to face with the guy, waiting for him to respond. Cyrus quickly stepped towards the group. What the hell is going on in my lab? He had scarcely heard himself speak that way, like an angry father who'd found out his kid had done something terrible. Everyone in the group suddenly turned around to Cyrus, though Byron didn't take his eyes from the young offender. Somebody better talk to me. 
Cyrus finally said after a moment of silence, placing his hands on his hips. Sorry, Cy. Another of Cyrus's colleagues had stepped out of the group. What's going on, Sabina? Cyrus asked her. This fledgling, she said, the term being a recognized insult to any programmer who was still new to the game, decided that it would be a good idea to call us suck-ups for getting to work so closely with you, she said. Sabina turned back to the group, eyeing the young programmer with what looked like disappointment more than anger. Did I get that right? She asked, speaking directly to the young man. He scoffed. An act that was akin to fanning a red blanket in front of a raging bull in the current situation. Byron nearly punched him square in the face when Andy stepped in to calm him down. Cyrus sighed, rubbing his eyes. He really hated workplace drama. It always got in the way of progress, and he had zero tolerance for petty conflicts. Okay, inside my office, please. Except you, Cyrus said, pointing to the kid. I'd like to have a word. Cyrus's group all made their way inside his office. Except for Byron, who still had his eyes locked on the kid. Byron, office, please. Byron smiled, suddenly flinching towards the kid. He recoiled, thinking he was about to be hit, but it never came. Feeling satisfied that he had won their silent battle, Byron turned away, heading towards Cyrus's office. Cyrus had so many employees under him that he sometimes forgot their names, but he distinctly remembered hiring the young kid. Kevin Chapman. He was a good programmer, young and talented. By the looks of him, though, he clearly suffered from some sort of superiority complex. But Cyrus remembered him being a decent but quiet kid when he had first started working there two years ago. Cyrus counted his lucky stars that there was no physical altercation. Boyd would have had a field day with that one. Byron Jones was a passionate guy, but the furthest thing from having any sort of violent tendency. But if there was one thing he did have, it was very little patience for those who felt they were better than others. From an outsider's perspective, Byron could definitely be classified as the group's muscle, strong as an ox and an IQ just as big. Though to his group, he was a giant teddy bear. Cyrus sighed, looking for a way to talk to the young employee before returning to his team, but Chapman refused to look at him. Look, I'm sorry if you feel like these guys are getting special treatment, Cyrus finally said after letting the air settle a bit. Just keep working hard and someday you'll be running this place, okay? The young intern finally looked up at him, smiling, though it wasn't a happy smile. It was the kind of smile that dripped with venom. I already am, Chapman said, turning around and disappearing from view before Cyrus could respond. There was something about the way the young worker had just spoken to him that chilled him to the bone. He nearly fired him on the spot, but he believed in second chances. If the kid went apeshit again, he would have to do something about it. Cyrus headed back to his office stopping in the doorway, leaning on its frame as he contemplated what just happened. The scene in front of him was one of tension, mixed with confusion. Everyone seated in thought, except Byron, who paced about the room. What the hell was that all about? Andy finally blurted, cutting through the silence that finally became too uncomfortable for him to bear. Don't worry about it, he's just a jealous kid, that's all. Sabina responded as she leaned deeper onto Cyrus's desk. Just take a few breaths and let's get back to work. We can't afford any slip-ups when we're this close. Nobody gave me anything, Byron said, nearly cutting off Sabina's final words. I worked hard for this job, goddammit. He finally stopped pacing, taking in a deep breath and flopping himself down into one of the chairs in Cyrus's office. Cyrus could never remember Byron speaking a word about his youth, but the frustration Byron exuded now could clearly be attributed to people underestimating his abilities from an early age. Not only was there an element of big equals dumb, but he had clearly been feeling the effects of racism in academia for years. And as much as some people like to close their eyes to social issues and live in an idyllic and stylized version of reality, things still had much room to improve for African Americans. Cyrus finally stepped into the office from the doorway, looking over his exhausted team, thinking carefully before he spoke. Listen guys, I want all of you to know that I didn't just bring you along on this ride to help you out. Cyrus's team all looked over to him. We are working together on this project because I believe that all of you are the best at what you do, and I couldn't have done anything without each of you here with me, he continued. I believe that together we can achieve the impossible. Just when Cyrus thought he might have an easy Friday before the weekend, he found himself making a stupid speech in front of his team, but he meant every word he said, and he could tell that they knew that. He truly cared for them, 
and he had hoped he had made the right decisions for them along their journeys. If the project fell through, or their source of funding had a change of heart, Cyrus didn't know if he could ever recover from that level of shame. If there was one thing he had going for him, it was that he believed in his own abilities, and he had faith in where they were headed in their project. He didn't have faith in much else, but he did have faith in that. Suddenly there was a knock on the frame of Cyrus's open office door. Mr. Parson, a voice quietly spoke. Cyrus twirled around, surprised to see Boyd Gonzalez staring at him from the frame of his office door. Though the smug expression that was normally carved upon his face was now one of serious concern. He couldn't ever remember Boyd calling him Mr., though he could immediately tell that this was no time to make a joke. What's going on, Boyd? He finally returned after overcoming his surprise. Boyd never came down into the depths as he referred to it, so something must have really been wrong. Cyrus unconsciously flinched for his pockets. Did he have his ID card on him? We have a, um... Boyd stuttered, clearing his throat. I'll need you to come with me, please. Cyrus nodded, turning back to his team. Guys, let's uh, reconvene a little later. With quick smiles and no words, everyone got up and headed back out to their workstations. As his team quickly shuffled out of the room, he finally approached Boyd. What's going on? I'll brief you along the way, Boyd quickly responded, gesturing for Cyrus to follow. The elevator ride up to the roof was uncomfortably silent, neither Cyrus nor Boyd knowing exactly what to say to each other. Okay, Boyd, I need you to throw me a bit of a bone here. Cyrus finally broke. Boyd took a deep breath before he spoke. Mark Harris. You know him, correct? Cyrus thought for a second before responding. Yeah, um, neural net department, right? With a slight jerk, the elevator finally arrived at the top of the building. Boyd quickly stepped out towards the door leading to the open roof, Cyrus following closely behind. Boyd stopped at the door, turning back around to Cyrus. Just to be clear, I didn't want to bring you into this. But we're out of options right now, Boyd said. Did Cyrus just hear Boyd's voice tremble? Cyrus was able to put two and two together, but he needed to hear Boyd say it to be absolutely certain. Mark is on the roof, threatening to jump, Boyd finally said after long considering his words. He's asked to speak to you, and only you. Why, I don't know. My god. That was pretty much all that Cyrus could utter at the moment. He knew Mark, but not well enough that Cyrus figured he could be of any use in this situation. Why Mark would want to speak with him now was beyond his comprehension. They had met at a few company parties, and in a few cross-department meetings over the years. But Mark was a good acquaintance at best, hardly considered a close friend. What do you need me to do? We need you to remain calm. Talk him down off that ledge. My guys can't get close enough to him, so just calm him down. Promise him whatever he wants. Then once he's down, we'll take care of it. He's right at the edge, so we can't risk him falling. Our tranquilizers won't do us much good if he passes out and falls off the edge. Boyd suddenly reached out, placing a hand on Cyrus's shoulder. Cyrus didn't realize how much his whole body was shaking until he felt Boyd's calm and controlled hand rest on him. He appreciated the gesture, even if he and Boyd could be considered mortal enemies on some level. Cyrus breathed deeply, in and out, in what felt like a futile effort to control his racing heartbeat. I'll do my best, he finally said. That's all I'm asking from you, Boyd smiled, turning to grab the door handle. The scene displayed before Cyrus on the rooftop was surreal. Hardly believable, and yet, there it was in real life. Six security personnel who were all stationed just outside the door, keeping a close eye on Mark Harris, who was seated at the end of the roof facing the door, teetering precariously at the edge. On any other day, a strong wind might have blown him backwards off of the roof. But luckily, or perhaps not, it was a calm day. Cyrus couldn't quite piece together enough of the variables within his frantic state of mind to truly believe that anything could really fix a scenario like this, yet it all rested on his shoulders. He couldn't quite recall ever feeling pressure like this in his entire life. Cyrus stepped carefully out onto the roof, his deductive reasoning quickly noting that there were no helicopters above, or sirens below. From the looks of it, the company had not informed the authorities about the situation, which really irked him and struck him as negligent. Clearly, they were trying to keep it quiet, 
tranquilize Mark, and ship him off somewhere to shut him up. But if Mark jumped, there would be no one here to do anything about it, and they could play it off as a freak accident. Cyrus flinched when he suddenly felt a hand on his back. He turned to see Boyd beside him. Just take it slow. No sudden movements. Boyd gently patted. We don't want to spook him. Mark was seated perhaps thirty feet from Cyrus, so the walk towards him was painfully slow and awkward. Hey, Mark. Cyrus waved, his voice slightly cracking as he spoke. Mark was seated on a waist-high barrier that separated the safety of the roof from the edge that plummeted more than thirty stories straight down behind him. He needed to think about what the best approach might be to get Mark down. If Mark leaned backward at all, he would fall for certain. Cyrus, Mark called, his voice shaking. I need to speak with you. Yeah, of course, Cyrus waved. I'm here for you, Mark. Whatever you need. Cyrus kept his pace slow as he got closer to Mark. Nearly inch by inch, it felt. Was Mark afraid of something? Cyrus willfully acknowledged that his social skills were not top tier, but to him, Mark sounded as if he was deathly terrified, so much so that he had been pushed to the breaking point. Cyrus didn't know the intricacies of suicidal thought processes, but the man seated in front of him had clearly been pushed, and Cyrus got the feeling as if Mark was being forced to do this. Please, come closer. Mark gestured to him. I have something I need to tell you. Cyrus took a moment, then stepped closer to Mark, and as soon as he reached arm's length, Mark suddenly lashed out. Grabbing Cyrus and pulling him close to the edge in a strong bear hug. Cyrus immediately tried to get free, but Mark's grasp was superhuman. Cyrus wasn't strong enough to pull him from the ledge onto the safety of the roof, and now he thought his life might come to an abrupt end. It's okay. Calm down. Mark said to Cyrus in a strangely calm voice, despite how much Cyrus was struggling. Stay where you are! Mark yelled out to the security personnel that suddenly began to move on their position. Calm down, Cyrus. I'm not going to hurt you. Calm down? Jesus, Mark! Cyrus finally surrendered to Mark's grasp. If Mark had intended on dragging him down off the ledge with him, Cyrus wouldn't go down without a fight. But he gathered that killing them both was not Mark's plan. Mark, what's going on? You're in great danger, Cyrus. Cyrus's eyes widened. What do you mean? Listen to me. You cannot trust anyone. His influence is everywhere. Even now I can hear him, beyond the veil, commanding me to stay silent, but I can't. I can't anymore, I just can't. The pain is too much to take. I need to break free. The urgency flooding Mark's fragile voice was frightening. Cyrus blinked, confused. Mark, what the hell are you talking about? I can hear him. Mark shook, grasping Cyrus tightly. He's always whispering. He's inside my head and I can't get him out. Mark, I, I don't understand. Please tell me what's going on. Again, Mark suddenly grasped him tighter, putting his head right next to Cyrus's. You need to look deeper. The tether that holds him is gone and he is free. Mark, let's just hop down off this ledge and talk about this. We can go to my office and drink some coffee. It's too late. Mark suddenly cut him off. He's embedded in my mind, and there's only one way to get him out now. Please tell my family. I love them very much. It all happened within a fraction of a second. But Cyrus saw everything in slow motion. Mark's hands lashing out, suddenly pushing Cyrus away from him. And Cyrus falling to the ground. And finally, Mark flying backwards off of the ledge. Cyrus was yelling, but he couldn't hear himself. He couldn't hear any of it. The footsteps of security personnel running to the edge. The sound of Boyd's voice as he spoke with the CEO over the phone. Everything was silent, moving as if time no longer ran at its normal pace. Cyrus kept telling himself there was nothing he could have done as he was escorted back to the building. But he would never know for sure. There would always be that bug in his brain, the unending feeling of doubt that would keep poking him, 
telling him that he was partially to blame for all of this. But at this moment, he didn't quite understand just how much of a difference he had actually made. Yes, that time.